Good evening, one and all. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation here on the Tattoo Historian's Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter channels. We're across all three channels tonight. I'm really appreciative of everyone tuning in and hanging out with us this evening. Thank you for supporting all of our live streams here over the past number of months. I've really appreciated your continued support. And I thank you again for being here tonight. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian. And tonight, uh, we have Steve Moore on. And Steve is a sixth-generation Texan, the author of multiple books on World War II and Texas history. On May 17th, he releases Patton's Payback, which we're going to talk about a lot tonight, the Battle of El Guitar and General Patton's Rise to Glory. Steve, how are you? I'm doing very good, John. A pleasure to be here with you. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you, my friend. I really appreciate you coming on to talk about this and more. Uh, everyone, I just want to give you a few more points on Steve's background before we get too far underway here with our conversation. Uh, Steve has given lectures for the Daughters of the Republic of Texas at the Alamo in the San Jacinto Museum of History at the Pritzker Military Library for various historical organizations and at World War II military assemblies, including the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, which is a fantastic museum that I just had a chance to visit for the first time last year. Uh, his most recent Texas book is a nonfiction companion to the History Channel's Texas Rising, which a lot of us saw back in 2015, a 10-hour miniseries drama about the Texas Revolution and the early Texas Rangers. Uh, actually, yesterday, Steve, I don't know if you saw, uh, Wall Street Journal did a little blurb about your book that came out, or is coming out. Yeah, uh, that was shared with me, and I was uh, I was pretty happy. That's actually a first to get picked up by the Wall Street Journal, so I'm happy. <laughs> Check that box. That's a yeah. good deal. Uh, Wall Street Journal said about uh, Patton's payback, like a latter-day Ernie Pyle, Moore wants to tell a story of men at the tip of the spear. Letters, home, diaries, and post-war interviews are the grist for Mr. Moore's mill, and he has a gift for melding them into a coherent narrative. That's quite the the spot from the Wall Street Journal, so that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm humbled by that. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that they picked it up and did a review. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. So I really uh, enjoyed reading the book, and, and I have looked back at some of the things you've done in the past and i would love to start in the past steve since we're talking about history I'd love to talk about your history uh when uh talk about growing up and and when history really became a thing for you yeah i guess even as a kid i was kind of always into writing I, I enjoyed that and i did i guess far better at that than i did at math and other subjects um my father was in the marines and ironically served on board an aircraft carrier uh, deployed with his platoon there during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and talked about nobody knows how close we came to going ashore. I mean, it was very, very close. And just seeing his old slides of going into all the harbors and you know, the Philippines and Tokyo and all these places, I, I, I kind of got enthralled with the carrier aviation aspect. And I probably read more military history books as a kid growing up than science fiction or stuff that my buddies might have been reading back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I, I probably wouldn't super enthused with, you know, seventh grade history or high school history, because to me, the books were pretty boring, you know, just cut and dry and to the point. Right. Probably when I got to reading uh, more eyewitness type history, uh, one of the guys that influenced me was uh, Walter Lord. He yeah. did Day of Infamy, uh, Incredible Victory about Midway, did the Titanic. He did a bunch of different books, but he interviewed where he, where he could countless, countless people you know, in the case of Pearl Harbor, Japanese civilians, you know, American servicemen, you know, women and kids at the time. And you got all these different unique perspectives of what was going on, whether they were trapped in a battleship that's floundering or, you know, in the air, you know, making the dives. And to me, that was interesting reading. So having to read something like that turned me on to reading other books that had, you know, similar kind of nature. And that got me more interested in history and eventually uh, to writing some history. I uh, went to school at Stephen F. Austin State University in East Texas in Nacogdoches and studied advertising and marketing. And of course, took my fair share of journalism. I worked on the newspaper there selling advertising, 
contributing an occasional article, but I just never had this desire to be a newspaper guy, and, you know, stressed out working at 10 o'clock at night, trying to make a deadline. Right. But I always had an enjoyment and a flair for writing. So I kind of kept doing it on the side. And it, years later, I think this was in the mid early 1990s. Uh, one of the guys that was actually a professor at Stephen F. Austin, Bob Grubel, he was part of a torpedo bomber squadron and Avenger squadron in World War II. And he taught, believe it or not, up into his late 90s until he passed away for the university. But he and the guys had always talked about doing a squadron history or some kind of book on their carrier battles from Guadalcanal all the way up through Okinawa. Mm -hmm. But they had no idea how to do it. I said, hey, I'm interested. You know, I'll help you out with that. Right. And one of his buddies, Bill Shineman, was a volunteer for what was then uh, the Confederate Air Force, I guess now Commemorative Air Force. Mm -hmm. And Bill did tons of oral histories. So he'd interviewed a lot of these pilots, gunners, you know, radio men, and they had a lot of stuff there, a lot of good newsletter material. So it was just a matter of digging in and starting to work on it. But then, of course, in the midst of doing it, I interviewed dozens and dozens of these guys and went to their reunion and all that. And uh, we put out a coffee table book called The Buzzard Brigade. Uh, Torpedo 10 was known as The Buzzard Brigade. And a lot of hardships, a lot of hard times off Guadalcanal, but a lot of big victories and a lot of important battles these guys were in. So that was the first book and just a little bit on me being interested in writing, but kind of always keeping it a, a side passion, I guess, if you will. I, I did go into advertising and marketing as a career field and continue to do so, but also continue to write. <laughs> mm -hmm. What was the transition like, Steve, from doing the the journalistic style of writing to book form was there any kind of a hurdle there or was it kind of for you was it kind of just a free-flowing kind of thing it was natural it's kind of weird I, just, I guess i adapt to it because in my you know marketing job i might be writing a owner's manual or a user's manual for a product that's technical in nature and then you're going to a quick punchy magazine type article to a full flown you know full-blown book and getting to dig in and flesh out the characters and all that. I, I guess I've shifted gears as easily as you can over time with those things, but I enjoy the books and, and, and what I do is always a labor of love. I've had offers that, Hey, this guy would make a great story or this thing would make a great, you know, campaign book, but I always take on something that personally interests me and, and that keeps it from being work, if you will, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. That, that nice level of separation is always a good thing, you know, so you don't, so you don't experience burnout, I guess. Uh, yeah. Well, you can get busy at times, but uh, yeah. when you see it and it comes out, especially if some of the veterans are still there to enjoy it when it comes out, that means a lot. And whether or not often their kids are really touched by it and, you know, that's what grandpa did or that's what dad did and stories he never told me about, you know, sometimes almost unbelievable. So right right what was it what was it like for you working on uh the book for texas rising because that was a big <laughs> popular history thing that a lot of us saw back in uh 2015 2016 era yeah kind of the backstory of that I, i've done a lot of texas history and that's how they kind of came to find me on that um my ancestor one of them was a uh, great 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 grandfather was a captain of texas militia texas rangers and texas army during the Republic years, you know, the 10 years that Texas was its own independent country. And so he fought in the revolution, fought at the battle of San Jacinto, and then in the subsequent Indian wars and lots of other conflicts, went on to be a legislator. And I did a lot of digging on him and, and, and writing a biography on him, which was my second book. But I found out so much stuff on the Rangers in the course of that that a normal book on the Texas Rangers is the 1870s, 1880s, and all the glamour era. In the 1830s, 1840s, maybe got just a smidge, just 20 pages, 30 pages in those volumes. And I came up with so much, I ended up putting out a, a four-volume set on the Texas Rangers during that 10-year period and, and the Indian conflicts at that time. So, And later went on to do a book on San Jacinto and the Texas Revolution. So long story short, when they came around with this History Channel series, they reached out to me and said, would I be interested in doing this? 
had a couple of people say, well, I don't know, but you know, some of these mini series and these <laughs> historical fiction things, if you really want to get wrapped up in all that. But I thought, you know what? I want a Texan to write a Texas version of this story instead of, no offense, somebody from up north or somewhere else <laughs> that doesn't have the enthusiasm that, that I had for knowing that they were going to cover both the Rangers and the Battle of San Jacinto. Now, the, the series, if you watched it, it was interesting, it was entertaining, and, and there were hopes of it going on to another season, which had my interest to really expand this whole Rangers story further. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think, unfortunately, it didn't sit well with all the audience out there, and you know, some of the, the drama was a little far-fetched, and you know, like uh, using dynamite in 1830 to blow up a bridge and, you know, things that some reality checks could have been put in place for, you know. Right. But I, I was thrilled to do the nonfiction companion book to that. And, and I'm proud of the book and the way it turned out. Uh, it did well. And a lot of, a lot of uh, good comments from people about that. And I enjoyed the series for what it was for, you know, good classic entertainment. Right. Did you see when you spoke about the book, the nonfiction book that you brought out for that series. When you've spoken about that with audiences throughout the years, up until at least the pandemic era, when we were still doing in-person things before that, uh, did you meet people who watched that series and that's what got them into it? Even though there were parts that were kind of like, uh, I don't know if that's so historically accurate, but but it's the idea of just sparking that interest. Did you find people like that or were there a lot of people that had already figured a lot of that out and they were just along for the ride. Yeah, probably a mix of both. You know, I, I knew, you know, historians and, and people around here that would kind of poke at me and say, Hey, you, you, you know, I went to school in Nacogdoches. I, I remember pine trees and green forests. I don't remember desert and rocks out there. And, and, you know, we, we kidded each other about some of that stuff, but uh, a good show, a good series will get people hooked on history and if it leads a person to go pick up the book or get the audio book and learn more of what really went on, uh, I, I think it's great to get younger generations, especially into reading, into learning and appreciating what's behind the movie that, you know, goes for 90 minutes. Right. Yeah. It's, it's getting the attention there first and right. then, then we'll, then we'll go to the nonfiction for a while. Right. <laughs> yeah. And clean up some stuff that, maybe it was incorrect or a little far-fetched, right? Right. Um, speaking of uh, popular history, popular culture, influencing uh, history in that way, Patton, uh, to me, will always be George C. Scott uh, <laughs> because it's just well, what I grew up with, right? Uh, it, when Why did you uh, decide you wanted to do something on either the North African campaign or Patton or both? What what was that kind of mindset? Actually, I'll, I'll give full credit to my uh, agent, uh, Brent Howard over with Penguin and uh, Dutton. It, we were at a point of looking at different topics. You know, he was ready for me to take on another project and we, we bat around ideas and I do, you know, a couple pitches here and there. And he came back and said, Here's a few ideas, but he goes, you know what? I could really see George Patton, his first big command campaign and how he kind of rose to power and had his first big victory and, and tackling North Africa. And I thought, sure, I'll, I'll take a look into that. I'll dig into it. And admittedly, you know, I was I was very weak on that subject because a lot of my World War II prior to that had been um, aviation groups, uh, carriers, uh, submarine books. You know, a couple of POW stories. So it was it was a learning curve, but I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, there's obviously some good books out there to start with, like Atkinson, uh, that gave me a good uh, overall view of, of, of the campaign and, and everything there. But as with any book, I really dive into it. And so people ask, what are you reading these days? Pretty much what I'm normally reading is whatever I'm immersed in learning at that time. And I, I want to go with the printed books and, and look at that. But then beyond that, get into the people that I can find. So uh, admittedly, didn't know a lot on the campaign, but really enjoyed what I learned from it. Yeah, when you go into a new subject like that or a new era of history like that and you and you get this idea or it's given to you uh, by an agent or, or a publisher, maybe you want to go this route. 
what do you think of as far as your research methods? Is it going to someone like an Atkinson first and then going down that road and seeing what contemporaries are saying or, or peer groups? Are you going that way first or are you thinking a different path uh, altogether? You know, I look at what's out there, especially for reference to see, you know, some of their sources and all that. But one of the first things I always do is dig into the people and come into this game as late as I did with North Africa. I, I knew there, there weren't going to be a lot of these guys left alive. Right. So for me, I, I really enjoy the personal stories and, and the people I can talk to. So, you know, the first month or two, that's all I did was try to track down people. And I'll reach out and I'll network and use sources that are available to me, such as museums and people I know that have done oral histories. Uh, ironically, another guy named Patton, uh, Colonel Don Patton, he's with the uh, World War II Roundtable up in Minneapolis. Uh, he's been doing that for many years and they, they work with a lot of authors, but Don is really connected with all branches of the service and all conflicts. And so I'd check with him to see who he knew, who might be living or who I should reach out to. And usually one thing leads to another. And uh, my goal, like I said, is just to try to track these guys down either in person or if they're at the point where they can't travel much or, or see visitors because of their age, get them on the phone and try to get permission for an interview that I can tape. Uh, one of the first guys for the patent book uh, I did connect with was an artillery man named Hubert Edwards. You know, grew up on a tobacco farm in North Carolina. And uh, he lived to be 101, almost 102, just passed away not too long ago. Mm. And he promised me he was going to be the last living World War II vet. And he <laughs> meant it. Uh, when I went to visit him, uh, we hung out all day with his wife. And, and he was still driving. He drove us to dinner and showed us around all of his buddies. And just had a big old time with, with you know, uh, Hubert and his wife, Linda. Mm. But he shared his stories. We talked about Patton. We talked about a chance encounter he had with Eisenhower a little bit later in the war. And just little, you know, tidbits, little small things. But for me, that that adds some interest to what's going on is what's this little common soldier thinking? This 17, 18 year old young man, you know, thrown in the midst of this conflict. Uh, Hubert was great. Uh, miss him. Uh, his wife's enjoying the book now. Wish he would have made it another six months or so. But uh, people like him and others I was able to track down from the North Africa campaign. That was my my first step. Uh, obviously, later you dig into the archives. Uh, a lot, you know, some oral histories are out there on different people, videos, uh, campaign reports where they did eyewitness statements at right after the Battle of El Guitar. So there was a lot of that available. But to me, I wanted to hit as many living pieces of history as I could while they were here. And with Patton's Payback, as with pretty much all of my books, unfortunately, the time it takes to go from researching to the printed book now, a lot of them aren't there by the time you get to the, to the end result. But I try to catch them as quick as I can while I can get their thoughts. Right, right. What was the uh, experience like for soldiers uh, in, in North Africa pre Patton? What, what were they experiencing there? Yeah, uh, Lloyd Fredendahl, the, the prior commander, uh, you know, we, we came ashore in November of 42, probably 125,000 or so allies went ashore. And there were some conflicts, but it was, you know, pretty quickly ground covered and moving forward. Uh, we weren't in the heaviest of fighting in the early months there as say the, the British had been, you know, having been in the North Africa campaign much longer than Americans. But excuse me, as we get into 1943, specifically in February, uh, pushing toward Tunisia, there's several key battles, key passes there, um, Fade Pass, Kasserine Pass, and some say that, you know, the Americans were solidly whipped. Some say that it was a strategic victory by the Germans being pushed back. But we suffered heavy losses. And the men came out of it realizing they were, you know, badly scattered, disorganized at times. And they had a commander in chief that was 80 to 100 miles from the frontline actions, issuing commands from a bomb proof bunker. And they called it Lloyd's Last Result or Shangri-La. And uh, 
some of his orders were so confusing, you know, that the generals had to scratch their head and figure out what the heck he was even issuing orders about. Mm. So it, it didn't take long after the mid-February uh, debacles there for it to, you know, reach Eisenhower that it's time for a change. But, you know, to answer your question from the men, you know, they're left wondering what's going to happen next, you know, new commander coming in. But uh, desert warfare was new to us. They'd done a lot of training in California and, and the deserts out there in Arizona to prepare for this. And of course, the war games in Louisiana with the tankers and the infantrymen working together. But, you know, this was America's first big push into a, a ground campaign in World War II. You know, not, not dismissing island campaigns such as Guadalcanal in 42, but th this was a different type of, you know, major landing and drive across an entire continent, if you will. Hmm. Was this a was this a demoralized army because of that issue of just not having proper leadership and no one knows what's going to happen next or orders are sent out then they're rescinded without anyone knowing? Is this a demoralized army that's just like already partially had it or are they just, you know, are they just trying to do the best they can with what they got and they'll figure it out as they go? Yeah, I think a little bit of both, but I think they're doing the best they can with what they've got. And I, I think, you know, some realize we've got some issues here with command and the structure and the way this is going, because, you know, we're not taking the ground we're supposed to take and, and hold off these Axis powers. But uh, of course, it you know does lead to Patton coming in in early March. You know, Eisenhower sends a few of his you know key scouts to take a look around and talk to the commanders and find out what's going on, what's the state of the troops. And, and they're in need of reorganization, you know, somebody kind of whipping them back into shape. And there's a couple of debates back and forth, but in the end, Patton's the guy and he comes in and, you know, as you read in the book, things change pretty quickly in terms of command style. Mm. What What is Patton the man like? Was he... How is he? I, I actually saw a video of him like three years ago and I never realized his voice was so high. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this guy's got a high pitched voice compared to what I would have pictured. But what's he what's he like as 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 a man, as a officer in the US Army? Yeah, like you said, you, you picture this big booming voice, you know, yeah. strong military commander, and here's this little guy with kind of a squeaky high pitched voice that tends to raise as he gets inflamed and gets yeah. excited. <laughs> he's passionate. He's aggressive. Uh, you know, he, he's got long service going back to pursuing Pancho Villa through Mexico and, you know, honored uh, by the military for his service in World War One, and then having extensive uh, tank experience. And, you know, he and Ike doing papers, pushing for different techniques and tactics with tanks. So they bring him in and say, you know, we need a, a good tank guy and, and you've got the tank background. So he's going to make sure to change some of the strategies, the way they operate more cohesively. But he's 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 vocal. He's brash. You know, he's he's foul at times. Uh, he's in your face and uh, he's forward. He leads from the front and believes in seeing people and in being seen, as some of his soldiers said. Uh, his trademark is wearing his uh, ivory handled Colts on his hips. Yeah. He's got his stars on his uniform, on his battle helmet, uh, even on his command vehicles when he goes forth toward the front lines. He's not the least bit worried about landmines, bombs, you know, strafing German planes. He, he's going to make an example that as an officer, you're going to be at the front, you're going to be seen, you're going to lead. And uh, he makes no qualms about that. Mm -hmm. How how does that impact the men themselves, when they see this guy's at the front, unlike Friedenhall, who's who was way back behind and in a bunker. Here's this guy that just doesn't really care like what happens to him personally. He's going to make an example for himself. Yeah, I mentioned Hubert Edwards a minute ago. Uh, one of his quotes to me was something along the lines of, you know, there's the classic, you know, Time magazine and other uh, uh, groups had seen him in the desert and the training and compared him to Flash Gordon and called him old blood and guts for one of his comments about you're going to be out there in the front lines and you're going to have to wade through blood and guts, you know, to be up there where you're going to fight. But they said, you know, instead of blood and guts, you know, it, it's our blood and his guts because he's pushing us out there to fight these battles. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, it, we can talk a little bit more about some of his tactics with the men, but yeah. he wasn't universally loved by the men, let's say, especially if you were one of the ones to have the ill fortune of being uh, in a run-in with him. And as Hubert said, um, I, I didn't care a thing about that man in this world, but you had to respect him as a fighter. And he did. Uh-huh. You know, when Patton came in March 6th, one of the first things he did was kind of shake up the officers there. You know, he'd come in at seven o'clock, seven thirty, take breakfast at the mess hall at his new command post. And here come the officers rolling in at nine o'clock, leisurely taking their breakfasts. And the first thing he says is tomorrow morning, mess hall shut down at seven thirty. That's it. And when they come water in late, they're not going to do it twice. Right. So he set the standard with the officers, but then he also set down you know, to the, to the, you know, the troop level, to the GIs, uh, you're going to wear, if you're an officer, you know, your tie, you're going to wear your leggings on your uniform. You're going to wear a steel hard hat, not these soft skull caps out there. If you're old enough to shave, you're going to have a clean face. And some take that for what it is. Some don't follow that. Uh So he sets to in your face, cursing you out, putting a $25 fine on you, which doesn't sound like a lot, but with what the guys were making back then, you know, that's a month's paycheck in some cases, you know, or even throwing them in the brig. So that and other reasons, Patton was not globally loved by all these GIs. Yeah, I've often found that that's a big myth, Steve, of, along, of, among a bunch of people, especially who grew up during the, let's say, the 60s, the 50s. There's this tendency to believe that Patton is just uh, this uh, deity in, in the Second World War, and it was just, uh, you know, he's loved and he's respected and all this sort of stuff. And it's and I've spoken with some of the veterans of under his command, just as uh, you have, and there there's kind of like this love-hate relationship. They're like, we knew he'd be there with us, but God, we just hated him, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of the characters, um, I did get to interview some of the uh, Darby's Rangers and track down one last living original member from the 1942, the June 42 muster roll, uh, Lester Cook. And we talked about Patton and we talked about what it was like to be part of this new elite army kind of special forces group, the training they went through and everything else. Uh, And aside from uh, Les Cook, there was another Les, uh, Les Ness that I follow he was not with us, but I was able to track down some of his personal papers that he'd given to somebody and some of his stories and uh, talk with some of his family members. And he was a very colorful character. Uh, he was called out by Patton, and I covered that in the book. But uh, Ness was on the raid with the uh, Canadians, one of the 50 Rangers to make that early raid uh, back in 42, and then also on the Sened Station raid. So he was one of just a handful to make two of the most important uh, raids involving the Rangers. And after the, the second raid against Senad Station, uh, he was given a battlefield promotion. So he goes from sergeant with his company of Rangers to second lieutenant, mm-hmm. one of a handful there right before the time of Fred and Dahl shifting over to Patton. Mm-hmm. So fast forward a couple of weeks later, Patton's whipping the troops into shape, doing what Patton's doing. Uh, preparing for El Guitar. And lo and behold, he runs uh, into these rangers with an army truck and hauling provisions back to the barracks, getting ready for another important raid on an Axis uh, front station. And Ness is called out by one of Patton's generals and kind of reprimanded for guys not wearing their hats, not in proper uniform, not wearing ties and all that good stuff. And there's a little Smart Alec, smart Alec mess about the guys and the way they're marched back to the command headquarters. And they're pretty cocky, kind of arrogant, the, the Ranger guys. And they, they, don't, they could care less about having to wear steel hard hats because they've been told they don't have to for the raid coming up. Long story short, Ness is hauled in before Patton and gets the reaming out of his life <laughs> and is threatened to be sent back stateside. And he said, do it. I could care. You know, send me back. Fine. Send me back stateside. <laughs> so here's a guy that just got a battlefield promotion as a hero. And two weeks later, he's getting reamed out by his new general Patton. So yeah, some of those Rangers didn't think a lot about Patton personally, you know, 
did you find anyone who respected him more than loathed him at all? Or was it kind of like a universal, like a 50, 50 or even more loathing than, than admiring? Yeah, probably somewhere 50, 50 or so. Again, like Hubert said, um, they respected what he did and how he led from the front and how he, you know, uh, motivated men to fight. If you were dragging tail and not taking a hill or not doing as you should, he would go to the front lines and call you out. And in cases at you know, certain times remove or replace you. <clears throat> so if there was an inept commander there, that person was not going to last too long with Patton. So they respected that part about him, I would say. But some of his tactics you know, didn't always sit too well with them. Yeah. Uh, do you want to <laughs> touch on one or two of those? I don't want to give the whole book away or anything like that. But his tactics with handling the men. And uh, because we often talk about tactics with battlefield tactics, which we can go over as well. But the tactics of morale and, and uh, like really, I mean, literally hitting soldiers what he's you know best known for because we saw it in popular culture and popular history back when the george c scott film that's where everyone's like wow he actually slapped someone uh you know and that wasn't probably the worst uh what was his what were his other tactics like with the men that he when you say he he pumped them up by like being up front with them was was he one for giving like uh pep talks to large groups of these guys or was he just like basically kicking them in the ass and saying, let's go. And, you know, yeah, he, he was doing a lot of kicking them in the ass, but he, he was seen on the front lines and made it clear. He was not afraid to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, at times they're like that crazy son of a gun is going to get himself killed because to prove his point, he would have his driver go straight through a minefield, you know, just dodging the mines as if, you know, I'm not afraid of this. So you're not going to be afraid of it. And he set those kind of examples. You know, some will criticize his techniques uh, as he got up there with uh, Terry Allen, <clears throat> one of his brigadier generals. They're taking shelter in these air raid shelters from the, the German bombers coming over and they've dug the, the trench ditches and all that. And he's kind of infuriated that they're, they're hiding in the trenches and he asked Allen, which one is your trench over there? It's pointed out and he walks over and proceeds to urinate in the trench, tells General <laughs> Allen, Go ahead and use that now. Let's see how you do in there. Wow. And it was embarrassing, you know, to Alan, obviously, around his fellow soldiers. But Patton was making the point clear that you're going to lead. Uh, another you know, prime example is him telling one of his officers, <coughs> excuse me, I got some allergies today. That's hard. Telling one of his officers, get more men to the front. In fact, get the officers to the front. And I want to see some officers killed before you come back. In other words, they're going to be on the front lines and you're going to be up there on the front lines and, and, and none of this stuff that the enemy was too deep, but we couldn't get past them. Uh, he, he didn't take that too well as an answer. <laughs> was was Patton a student of history as much as we've seen before in previous times where he's like he's looking at battlefield tactics from a historical standpoint? Or is he really studying the enemy more than anybody else and trying to come up with these ideas of attack and defense. Yeah, you know, he's pulled out of the campaign before the end of it so he can work on Operation Husky, the uh, operation to invade Sicily. So he's got plenty of time to work with the allies and study the maps and study the tactics and work on that. You know, in fact, North Africa, he's kind of pulled into it midstream, but he'd always wanted to fight and be on the front lines. So that was kind of a dream come true for him. You know, as a kid, he was obviously aware of history and studied it. You know, he, he kind of thought maybe in a previous life he might have been, a, you know, a Roman emperor or, you know, with Napoleon's army. It, he believed in reincarnation and had lots of things that some people might have thought were kind of crazy. But uh, he was obviously aware of history, classic victories, classic mistakes. He studied, <clears throat> studied tactics quite a bit, uh, particularly with uh, the tank warfare with Armored. And like I said, had written uh, papers prior to World War II on how these should not be more troop carriers, but, you know, used in conjunction with the infantry and a whole different uh, tactic there. So you know, he believed in getting in and, and, you know, attacking the enemy and hitting them from the back. And, and he was really strategically 
involved in that. And if he went out on the front lines and saw artillery uh, pieces on the wrong side of a hill or troops positioned in the wrong place, he would call out the, the commanders and say, those guys need to be over here. Artillery needs to be on this side of the hill over here. So he was aware of that on a, on a larger scale. And as I said, he, he was not afraid to go to the front lines. Uh, March and April of 43, he's up there quite often at the command posts, you know, to see what's going on and to urge people forward. Uh, one of his uh, generals, uh, nicknamed Pinky Ward, uh, Ward was not moving in the fashion that, you know, Patton wanted. And he, he ordered him to move forward and take this certain hill, whether people get killed or don't get killed. And he, he kind of wrote to his wife. He, he did a lot of correspondence, kept a diary. And he said, I'm afraid I may have sent this man to his death, but, you know, pretty much he needed it. <laughs> and uh, Ward and his men did charge the hill. They took it for a short time. Uh, he was wounded, earned a silver star for that. And uh, although he was replaced later by Patton, you know, he had to admire, okay, you know, maybe I made a man out of this guy, at least for this week, uh, by, by telling him it's going to be this way or else. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't afraid to step in if things weren't going as he thought they would. Uh, at, at times, he overstepped his boundaries with his uh, British superiors, the Allies, uh, had some famous conflicts and arguments with them on air command and, you know, not moving to the place at the time he was supposed to. So... He kind of did things his way in a certain respect. Yeah, he wasn't a very politically savvy general. He was just a, a battlefield tactician who, who kind of just, you know, he he was, it's kind of ironic that you that you wrote uh, this book, Steve, in that he would have been like the perfect Texas Ranger. Right. You know? <laughs> he's, he's got that kind of attitude, and, I, and maybe that's from his experience on the border going, going uh, over to try to locate Pancho Villa with, uh, with Pershing and, and those men in the punitive expedition, he's got the kind of this like gung ho attitude of we're going to find the enemy. We're going to attack him. We're going to obliterate him, and we're going to move on to the next objective and uh, not realizing that, Hey, you might have some significant losses <laughs> doing, doing that kind of maneuver, but he's looking at the end goal of if I stop, then I lose that momentum. Yeah, I think one of my, my favorite stories on him that's related later in the book is, uh, as you say, he, he wasn't afraid to stir it up or cause some controversy. And he kind of got into a, a back and forth match with the, you know, Allied Air Command, the British that had control over the air, that you're not protecting us. You're letting these Germans come in and bomb the heck out of us every day. And you guys are off doing some other stuff instead of covering us like you should. And there were some comments made by the British that insulted him and his command. And uh, it went back and forth between these two to the point where it reached the Pentagon and lots of higher ups on this little hissing match that's going on between the two. And it gets kind of vocal. And Patton says, basically, you know, if you said some of the kind of things to me that, you know, to a superior, you would have been on your way back home. But being what it was, they ended up coming forward to finally kind of bow down and meet Pat and say, okay, let's have a talk. Let's go to his command post and talk about this air command thing. And in the midst of that, as if it was planned, here comes German bombers in bombing Patton's headquarters there. And of course he and his character, his, his style races out with his Colt pistols firing at the planes as they're departing. And they go back in and one of the British guys says, that's pretty good, George. I, I don't know how you uh, managed to orchestrate that, but that's pretty impressive to drive home your point. And he said, you know what? If I could find those German SOBs, I would give each of them a medal. You know? <laughs> so his point was well made, but uh, yeah. he wasn't afraid to stir it up with anybody, even if it was his superiors or his allies. Yeah. You talked to, uh, <clears throat> or you spoke <clears throat> briefly about Sicily and and this this idea of going into Sicily and, and in the future going up the Italian boot. How does El Guitar and North Africa influence that maneuver into Sicily? Why is El Guitar and the North Africa campaign after Patton really comes into the fold? Why is that so vitally important to uh, U.S. Army history and Second World War history in general? Yeah, it, it was a big uh, proving ground and learning ground for you know, the Allies, the Americans especially. 
tactics, men, armored, uh, some of these special forces like the, the Rangers that we touch on and, and how all this works, taking hills and, and holding off charges and, and things. But uh, the North African territory is prime because it also positioned us to have key air bases for what's going to come next with the European invasions. So it's prime ground to take. Uh, you know, Patton didn't make it to the end of the campaign. He's pulled out and one of his, uh, you know, sub generals is elevated to, to finish out the campaign. But the stage had been set and he, he had some good. Uh, lessons learned on paper and on the battlefield to apply to the, the landings in Sicily. And I think we were better prepared, you know, by the time we get there and of course, Italy and uh, France and all the other, you know, campaigns follow. But this is the first big cross continental desert campaign for the Americans to learn from. And it, it was a great learning ground for our, our troops. Yeah. And I don't want anyone uh, watching to think that the, the book is all like, one-sided that there's only a u.s or british perspective in here you have you have the germans in here as well and <laughs> and did they see any kind of a difference in the in the american fighting uh force once Patton came into command as they did when they uh knew that there was a different commander before Patton with with friedendahl did they did they see a big difference or uh, a more aggressive uh american army when Patton comes in you know, at the time, uh, from what I could learn, they weren't really aware that Patton had taken charge. He was not uh, you know, this well-known general to, to the Germans at the time. Uh, of course, you know, he, he relished the thought of going up against the famous desert fox, uh, Rommel. And, you know, he, he was there through February of 43, but uh, Rommel was recalled back to Germany before the El Guitar campaign kicked off. So from what I could learn, uh, no, they weren't really... Uh, on any large scale aware of Patton being the new commander or, or some of that turmoil that had gone on there. I'm sure it became more apparent later, but uh, being that a lot of this book, the research was done and the interviews were done during our pandemic, right. uh, I was challenged. I did have some friends in Germany. I reached out to, to find more sources. Uh, Rudy Schneider was the uh, personal driver for the desert Fox for Rommel. Uh, he was still living at the time, and I tried really hard to try to get an interview set up with him. But uh, I did get some papers and things from from the family there and from some friends. But he was kind of in the, the, the convalescent home, or you know, kind of in his latter stages. But right. uh, had it been a few years earlier, I would have loved to gone to Germany and try to connect with a few guys to get more of their side of the story. So I didn't get as much as I would like, but I do try to offer. Uh, a perspective from the other side as much as I can. Um, with another book I'm doing now, I'm, I'm trying to do that as best I can also. Uh, yeah, David, actually, uh, thank you for being here, David. David actually asked uh, if you interviewed any German. That would have been an amazing get yeah. to be able to, to, to get uh, get his driver to, to you know, be there. But yeah, it's, it's tough. Yeah, I couldn't connect with him personally, but I did have some of his stories and a couple other uh, authors and historians shared a little bit. Uh, some guys have done some interviews and oral histories with some German soldiers. And I was able to draw some information from that and, you know, a couple of quotes here and there. But, uh, you know, being a different time in our world, it would have been easier. You know, researching during the pandemic has been tough. Uh, it's just started to improve this year. But the, as you probably know, the National Archives were closed most of that time. Right. Museums, libraries were closed. All these key sources, uh, you know, luckily we had the Internet, but getting things I would normally be able to go find myself or ask a researcher to help me track down certain papers was either impossible or, or next to impossible. So with this book, with Patton, I did the best I could under the circumstances we were kind of... Uh, held back with, you know, during that time. Right, right. Were there any <laughs> surprises, Steve, from when you maybe thought of your first thesis for the book and you started researching or your first idea <laughs> with this kind of a book? Were there any surprises along the way with your research where you're like, well, I didn't didn't realize that happened or I didn't see that component coming into the mix? Did you see any of that during this process? I think in general, like I alluded to earlier, I, I just I didn't have a, a deep, uh, you know, background on the campaign. So I learned a lot in general. 
And a lot of it was very fascinating. You think of the classic uh, tank battles that, you know, happened in World War II. Uh, at El Guitar, it, it wasn't quite that case, you know, especially the big battle on March 23rd. You've got 50 or more German panzers, you know, rolling forward with the infantrymen. But what they ended up kind of dueling it out with is our little M3 tank destroyers. You know, these are fairly thin skinned compared to some of the big German tanks. And the little boys are holding their own, holding the hills and, and fighting to the point where I think it was the 601st uh, tank destroyer battalion had 21 out of 31 of their tank destroyers knocked out that day. And I do follow some of those guys, uh, Tom Morrison, uh, Slim Yowl from Texas, uh, Mike Steima, and what they went through on that day, you know, talk to their kids. Uh, you know, these guys weren't with us anymore, but they had papers and they had stories that the kids had and kind of the, you know, David versus Goliath uh, thing there. That was interesting to me. And I, I of course, made a pretty good part of a, a chapter about that uh, particular engagement. And we, we held them off. And then there was another charge in the afternoon by the Germans. And we were better prepared at that time. But, you know, the, the small armored against the big armor was uh, interesting to me in that part of the campaign. Yeah. Uh, before we went live, you spoke with me about <laughs> some of your modern day work. And I would love to touch on that as well, uh, since we're since we have you here. I think it's a fascinating thing, and I know that I have a couple of people who follow me who who do this as a hobby. Uh, but talk with us about visiting some of these historical sites in Europe and elsewhere, and uh, with with your work with uh, metal detecting and and so forth. Yeah, I've worked in ad agencies and different marketing companies over the years, but uh, the past sixteen years, I found myself uh, handling marketing for company called Garrett Metal Detectors, and we make the metal detectors that you pass through to go into the Olympics or the football stadium or, you know, the college graduations. But then we also make the uh, metal detectors you search for gold and, and coins and relics and treasures with. So as part of my job, we get out to the field and we go to the big rallies and the big organized hunts, talk about our products, demonstrate our products and, and go to these really cool hunts in other parts of the world. And one of my favorite places is always getting over to England or Europe. And I've been able to go to Italy and Germany and a lot of time in England. And in some cases, you know, we get to visit some of these battlefields. And we had one episode where we got to work a couple of times with the archaeologists in, in, you know, parts of Germany and Belgium where there had been significant conflicts. And uh, you're finding... In one case, we were looking for a, a German fighter and another Allied plane that had gone down. You're you're finding remnants of the plane, looking for uh, numeric markings, you know, uh, serial numbers. But you're finding 50 caliber shells, uh, some unexploded, uh, bomb ordnance, uh, all kind of you know things out there. Sometimes you know personal belongings and things like that. Uh, it, it's preserving and identifying where things happened or where somebody was lost. With our company, we, we support other initiatives, uh, a couple of groups that go out and, and work to look for soldiers' remains in, in distant parts of the world, whether it be a battle or, in a lot of cases, an aircraft crash, okay. trying to you know find the metallic evidence with the metal detectors, but then ultimately excavating and trying to find bones, remains, personal effects that can be brought back home 70, 80 years later mm. to give, you know, kids or grandkids some kind of closure. So getting to work on historic projects like that has been fun. Uh, here in Texas, I've been able to go to battlefields from the 1830s, the, the Indian Wars, the Texas Revolution, and in some cases, dig up buttons or musket balls that could have been lost or fired by my triple great grandpa or one, you know, one of my other ancestors. Mm -hmm. So finding history and finding out why it's there and what happened, that, that's kind of a cool part of tying in the detectors with the, the love of history that I have. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I'm, I'm glad to see people doing that. And I've, I've seen other uh, organizations as well who have utilized this technology uh, such as the kind you've utilized, and then they've <clears throat> mapped out where they found stuff. So you can actually map where the front line was, or you can map where uh, people were buried and, and such. And it really brings that 
scope of the combat to life in many cases. And it's, it's just incredible to see that that is now becoming even easier to do because of the technology like you're utilizing. Yeah, one of my favorites was probably uh, the Battle of San Jacinto, where Texas independence was won, you know, having two ancestors that fought there. Obviously, uh, national parks and, and places of history that are protected like that, it's against the law to battle the tech. But when you're working in conjunction with the archaeological groups, you're excavating and you're, you're finding the history. Of course, you're not keeping it. You're turning it over to them. But seeing some of it, the musket balls, the buttons and stuff from the Mexican army that day, and they're pinpointing them on their on their computers and the color coding each little piece. So where was Santa Ana's camp or where did he surrender? Where was the hot action? Was it exactly where the markers say it was? And oftentimes it's not quite there. We did some excavation where they cut lanes through some thick forest along the retreat lines. And we found where large groups of Mexican soldiers had uh, surrendered and dumped out their shot pouches where you might find 50 musket balls in one pile, you know, buried in the dirt there a uh, hundred and some odd years ago, 170 years ago or so. Uh, it, so it helps the historians have a better, you know, more accurate uh, depiction of where things happen, certain events happen, whether it's finding the aircraft wreckage or just uh, archaeological surveys on a battlefield. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, what's next for you? What projects do you have in mind going forward? Well, uh, doing the uh, the armored command with with Patton and the, and the desert warfare kind of led to a, a follow up book or another book, uh, America's top tanker ace uh, Lafayette Poole. Uh, he was nicknamed War Daddy, mm -hmm. and uh, if you remember the the movie called Fury with Brad Pitt, his nickname was War Daddy, which was kind of borrowed from Lafayette Poole, and the the tank name Fury was borrowed from another. Uh, third armored tank that actually you know served in the conflict there in, in Europe, but uh, following Poole's tank, you know ashore at Normandy and into Belgium and, and France and finally into Germany before he's finally knocked out. Uh, he destroyed at least uh, half a dozen German tanks, so he was a bona fide ace with the more than five destructions, <clears throat> but destroyed. Uh, countless military vehicles, Jeeps, armored vehicles, uh, received the Distinguished Service Cross, written up for the Medal of Honor, uh, the Army's top uh, tank hero of the war before uh, his, his own tank was knocked out for the third time and he lost his leg. Uh, ended up coming back and went back to service after the war with the Army with the prosthetic leg. Uh, quite a character. So a uh, War Daddy Pool story will be coming out uh, this fall. You can look for that in the Walmart stores. Nice. And uh, the next one after that I'm working on is a submarine story, kind of going back to my love for the Pacific War. Mm -hmm. And this one was kind of ironic. I, I, I met this guy on an airplane going to England two years ago, a year and a half ago. And I saw his sub vets jacket and his cap. And I knew the boat and what they did. And I started talking to him and he's like, you know anything about what I did? I said, yeah, yeah, you were on the sailfish. You sank the Japanese carrier that had the American POWs. He was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you're, you're just you know, amazing me that you're you know, so much younger than me and you know any of this kind of history. And he said, yeah, they had American POWs on the, on the uh, carrier when we sunk it and only one of them lived. And I said, uh, yeah, George Rocek. And uh, he's like, you heard of George Rocek? I said, yeah, I actually interviewed him years ago for a book. And I don't think Bill believed me. <laughs> he thought it was just too happenstance. Yeah. But uh, long story short, we've been working on a, a pretty good story of what Bill Submarine did, uh, being the former squalist that was sunk and raised from the depths in 1939, renamed the Sailfish, and the strange story with the Sculpin and her loss and, and some of those POWs. Uh, so quite a story there. Uh -huh. And did manage to track down a really good Japanese account of the loss of, of the carrier. So I've never seen that published. So yeah. it, it's been fun. <laughs> yeah, you're sitting on a little gold mine there. I've never seen that published either. So <clears throat> that's, that's awesome, my friend, that's awesome. Yeah, and having somebody that's approaching 98 years of age and having the enthusiasm and, and the, the vigor that Bill has and the memory, it, it's you know quite a blessing to have that opportunity. So yeah. anybody that does this, I say, jump on those opportunities while you can because 
you look at it months later and think, okay, I'm ready to talk to this guy. I may not, you know, maybe past your time at that point. So I enjoy trying to track down the living history while we have them. Mm -hmm. I've done one on Vietnam where I got to interview a lot of the veterans that were in special forces, Mac V. Sog, uh, went to their reunions. Mm -hmm. In a lot of cases, they could not talk publicly about any of the stuff they did because they were across the fence behind enemy lines and it was all classified and had to convince some of them that it was okay to actually talk about it, uh, sometimes with the help of their comrades. But uh, getting those stories out is important because even those guys are younger compared to the World War II generation. Right. Uh, I've, I've lost some of them since that Vietnam book, you know, came out a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. talk to them while you can. That, that's my uh, advice. Yeah, it's great advice, Steve, because I think we learned uh, a lot about what it's like to be separated from them and each other during the pandemic when we can't really talk you know, one-on-one -on -one in a private environment with just us and a recorder sitting there. And it's, we can't take that for granted anymore, you know, especially that we're not getting any younger. They're not getting any younger. And it's great to see 95, 98 year old veterans who still have the vigor when they were like 60, you know, it's just a number. Yeah. A lot of these guys, you know, I've been doing this 25 plus years they didn't talk a lot about it when they were in their forties, their fifties, cause they're still working. They've got careers and, and, and World War II is like this guy, Bill says, <clears throat> that was just a blip in my life. I'm almost 98 now. That was two or three years that was what it was. But, you know, as they got older and started going to reunions in the seventies and eighties, they talked more openly about it. In a lot of cases, the kids didn't hear the stories or have the chance to hear dad talk about that because it was too painful or he didn't want to, or they couldn't relate to it. But now as, as these guys age, uh, a lot of them are more open in the past, you know, 10, 15 years. Uh, you mentioned World War II Museum in New Orleans. There, there's plenty of other great groups like that that have made a serious effort to go out and do these oral histories and the videos with these men and the women that served in, in, in all the different conflicts. And, We'll we'll have the luxury of having that for reference material decades from now, but we've gotten more interested, and I think they've become more open in the past couple of decades to talk about this because when it's gone, what are our kids going to remember? And is it going to be washed out of the history books because it's controversial and we shouldn't talk about Jewish people being killed or you know genocide or, or whatever the case might be? You know, I'm not saying that anything's wrong with what's gone on in recent years, but some of the history, um, we want to tell the good history, not the bad history, but it, it's all part of learning from the past and sometimes learning from our mistakes, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what makes us better, right? It's uh, one of those things where we ourselves personally have to look at what our issues are so we can overcome them. And uh, I've always seen as a, a collective for all of us in the history field to be that kind of thing where we look inward and say, yeah, we maybe not, maybe we should not have done this, but uh, we can learn from it and we can be better. And uh, yeah, you know, I'm not perfect. I, you'd probably say you're not either. Uh, our modern generation is not. And certainly things we did 50 years ago, 200 years ago to different people was not right. right. Uh, it's what it was at that time. And, and we have to acknowledge that and keep it as part of the history and hopefully we don't repeat those kind of things. So yeah, we, we hope the younger generation keeps reading or listening to audiobooks and, and learn from this stuff and, and seek out these veterans that are still with us and ask them their stories. In most cases, they're thrilled that somebody even cares to talk to them, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we may be the only outlet for them because they're still not comfortable talking with their family in that way they may not want to be remembered for that they want to be remembered for something else in their life and like you say a couple of vets have told me well that was only three years of my life i want to be remembered for what i did after the war and right. so so you, it's a, it's all a different storyline for each and every one and i think that's what makes it a really uh beautiful moment when you can share those experiences uh with them and and learn from it and you definitely did that uh, in this book, and, uh, and I'm sure I'm, I'm going to get a lot out of your future ones, and so is my audience, because you continue to do that 
with the original sources and uh, whether they are with us or whether they have passed something on to their family. Utilizing those documents and primary sources is so very important. And uh, you obviously do that, Steve. And we appreciate your hard work and dedication to the past, even during a pandemic, when I know it's terrible to try to research <laughs> during a pandemic. Uh, but hopefully bringing a book out at the end of the pandemic is going to be a very worthwhile thing. Uh, Steve, uh, I really appreciate you coming on and, and spending time with us to talk about Patton's Payback. Uh, the Battle of El Guitar and General Patton's Rise to Glory, and every uh, other piece of work that you've done so far, and, and giving us a little uh, taste of what you're going to work on in the future. And uh, I, I definitely want to tell everyone in the chat that I did put links in the chat to the book so you can purchase that and go from there and see the other works that Steve has done. Uh, but Steve, once again, I really, really appreciate you coming on here and, and talking with all of us across all these channels. Pleasure speaking with you. Thanks so much for having me and uh, best wishes. Keep doing what you're doing. It's important. You're teaching people and I, I think they're obviously appreciating what you're doing and benefiting from it. So hats off to you. Thank you, Steve. I really, really appreciate that. And and please stay safe and, and be well and uh, keep telling these stories because it's so very important. And uh, I would love to have you back on in the future to talk about the next book or the next project. Well, we can talk about War Daddy this fall, or we can talk about submarines down the road or whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I'll slap my uh, third armored patch on for my grandfather, and we'll talk about some War Daddy stuff. So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Uh, I appreciate each and every one of you, whether you are watching this live or later. I know a bunch of you watch later after we're offline because you can watch it whenever you like. Or if you're listening to this when I make this into a podcast, thank you for joining us. Please go check out the book. I've placed links in the chat and I've placed links in the event page so you can find it right there. Uh, we will talk with all of you very soon. Please stay safe, keep reading, and we will see you later. <laughs>